Recently, a couple of members of the church mentioned a couple of things that happened on the job with them concerning all of this trans business that's going on and how that they made reference to some person in a way that was not politically acceptable and they got called on the carpet for it. That led to comment to me as to our need to study what the Bible says about in being faithful to the Lord in all things and wherever we are, that we need to understand that we can be persecuted and that we will be persecuted. And that doesn't mean that we'll all be thrown to lions tomorrow or burned at the stake. We must not be ignorant, as Paul said, of Satan's devices and how things work. I want to deal with that directly in a later sermon, if the Lord will, but I've decided to preface that particular study with what I think is necessary for us to be reminded of about what it is to walk the straight and narrow way that leads to heaven, about being faithful members of the church we have for so long in this nation because of the Constitution and actually the First Amendment concerning the protection of religion and the practice of it, not had to be concerned about that. But as you well know, in recent months and years, people have, in the name of law, gone against law. And the importance of proper authority for how we believe, and how we live, not only in matters of religion, but in matters of the functioning of any society. And we must understand we truly are pilgrims as members of the Lord's church and faithful to him. We're truly pilgrims in this world. We're strangers and foreigners in this world. Now, some of us have been strangers and foreigners in other lands where they spoke a different language, their culture was different, the way they conducted themselves, their traditions, and so on. And it makes one alien to that culture, and you have to adjust to it. We as Christians dare not adjust what we believe and how we live to the worldly-minded people. Thus, persecution is a part of being faithful to Christ. I'm going to have more to say about that later on. But I want to speak today as preface to this upcoming sermon, the Lord willing, I can get it together. The very cost of being a disciple of the Lord. What it costs a person who is a faithful disciple of the Lord. Jesus, in his earthly ministry, working primarily, of course, with the Jews in the flesh, he was a Jew, did a lot of vaccinating of those people who would believe on him and follow him. And by vaccinating, I simply mean he was trying to show them how that they needed to be prepared for what would come when they believed on him and followed him. That is, they would become his disciples. And in Luke 14, beginning in verse 25, Luke chapter 14, verse 25, he had this to say. Because notice how it begins as Luke records it. And great, there went great multitudes with him. Great multitudes, that's a lot of people. They're following him because he turned and said to them, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother, that means love them less than they love him. The same is concerning his wife and children and brethren and sisters. Yea, in his own life also, 
Now look how plain this is. He cannot be my disciple. And whosoever, that's as broad as those it covers, anybody. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. They understood full well what a cross was. It was a terrible, shameful, painful, agonizing type of death meant to be mean and mock, belittle, and shame. Not only the one dying on that cross, but all of those of his family and friends who would have him as a friend to die that way. Then he begins to interrogate them as he teaches. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient, sufficient to finish it? Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it began to mock, make fun of him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first and, consider, and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage, an ambassador, and desireth conditions of peace. Now he makes his application next. So, there's your conclusion. Likewise, like I've just described to you, whosoever, anybody, anywhere, he be of you that forsake of not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Now what does that mean? It means there must be in the mind, the heart, the inward man of the person who would follow Christ, who would be his disciple. That nothing, nothing, not one thing can stand between me and obeying him. And he plainly makes it clear you must love me better than you love anybody else. Or he says simply in verse 26, you cannot be my disciple. Now I've often wondered when you realize he turned back to these great multitudes that were following him. What they actually got out of that. In verse 34, he moves to a different paragraph. It says, salt is good, but if the salt have lost its savor, where they shall be seasoned. It's neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Pay attention. This is important. If you have the ability to understand what I said, you need to understand this. We might say if we were in a class, the teacher would say, you need to know this past test. You need to put this down in your notebook and underline it because it will be on the test. And I would say anyone that first begins to consider becoming a Christian must begin here. You may be persuaded from the evidence that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, that He is the way, the truth, and the life. But if you don't have this disposition of heart that He comes before anything else in life, then Jesus plainly said, He who came to seek and to save that which was lost, the great physician, the remedy, the only remedy for sin, He says that unless you love me more and better than anybody else, you cannot be my disciple. And that gets pretty serious. I think what we need to do when we strive to teach other people is somewhere pretty quickly on in our study emphasize that point. Because a religion that costs nothing is worth nothing. Christ knew that. So what does it cost to be a disciple of the Lord? Now I hope you're seeing why I'm using this before we ever get right down to the specifics of persecution that could come our way and has to a certain extent come our way for those who are faithful to the Lord in our present times. Well, notice again verse 33. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not only the hath, he cannot be my disciple. In other words, are you willing, if the Lord so directed you, to give up whatever it may be? It's an attitude of speak, Lord, thy servant heareth command and I will obey. Why? Because 
as we sing in the song, Jesus, pilot of my soul. He's the only one that can pilot me from earth to heaven. There's not anybody else. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Then we have again Matthew 6 and verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Christ must come before any other concerns in life, food, clothing, shelter, whatever. So putting all these things before the kingdom of God and his righteousness is showing one thing, little faith in Christ and his gospel system. And just before he got to verse 33 and verse 30, he basically said that, O ye of little faith. A scribe happened to say to Jesus, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest, in Matthew 8, verse 19. But I've often wondered about what that fellow really thought and the look on his face when the Lord responded in Matthew 8, 30, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Now, none of us are in that position. We have lived in a country so richly blessed by God. We have been, in material things, we have enjoyed God's favor. He has poured out His blessings on us in this nation in more ways than we can count. The problem is, is that when you live in that kind of situation, you think that's just the way it always has been. But anybody that's a student of history knows that most of the world's history when it comes to serving the true and living God has not had that in store for God's people for very long. And the Lord knew that. In the earthly ministry, he's telling those people, you've got to be prepared for that. In Matthew 8, 21 and 22, and another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, Suffer me first to go bury my father. Notice how the Lord took this occasion to teach, teach the same lesson we're making here. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me and let the dead bury the dead. The people of this world who care not for God will take care of the things of this world. Dead means separation. Let those separated take care of the things of this world. You have been called out of this world by the great gospel of Jesus Christ. You recognize through the gospel the place of Jesus Christ and who he is. You have insights nobody else has. When you think of what you know, though all of us would like to know a lot more and be better able at practicing it, think of what, where you are in your knowledge in contrast to all these folks around about us that are not Christians. And again, I use that word Christian as it's used and defined in the New Testament, not as denominational people do. Our people who are not members of any religion believing in Christ would use it. You see, the word Christian is really pretty limited in its application to just a certain few. Then we read in Philippians 3, 7 and 8, Paul's disposition of mind toward his life as he writes to Christians, to encourage that same disposition of mind in their living. Now, Philippi was a Roman colony. It was a Gentile area. Roman colony meant that it had things going on there like went on in Rome. Things were allowed there, permitted there, and lawful there that would be different from any other, place, the other places in the empire. So they were very much exposed to just how things were done in the imperial city of Rome. And he says to those converted out of that background, but, that, but, the, but what things were given, gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Philippians 3, verses 7 and 8. 
Remember what we said so often lately that most of the New Testament is written to members of the church, to Christians, to disciples of Christ. And we're taught over and over again to have the mind of Christ. And it's in this same context where he will say that you need to have the mind of Christ. Well, let this mind be in you, he will say. Let has the force of a commandment, brethren. As a child of God, I'm commanded to have the mind of Christ. Now, where do you find that? Well, if it's not in the last will and testament of Christ, the New Testament, you don't find it. That's where I learned to think as Christ thinks. To view this world as Christ does. To deal with this world as his word says I should. And thus, while he was on earth, he delivered this great message on the cost of discipleship. Well, here's another thing it costs if you're going to be faithful to the Lord. It costs loving one's own life less than one's love of God's good will. Now, over in Matthew 10 and verse 39, Jesus, in speaking in this context, said, He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. And then we've already noticed in Luke 14, 26, If any man come to me and hate not or love less his own father and so on, he can't be my disciple. This is just part of it. To help us get ready to meet whatever kind of persecution may, may come, why not go back to the time when they actually died for the cause of Christ rather than give up their faith, rather than disobey Him? When they actually went to prison rather than disobey Christ? Where they were deprived in so many ways of many things that everybody else around them who were seeking to make peace and satisfy all the enemies of Christ, they enjoy it. They don't have to worry about it. Well, again, the laws of our country from our Constitution has protected the free exercise of religion and the establishment of religion. <clears throat> but you know, laws and constitutions are only as good as the people that want to keep them. And there's nothing that says enough people in this country can't get to the point where they can amend that Constitution and make laws derived to suit themselves from it. Because after all, remember, the idea of our country and true of any democratic form of government is the majority is going to have its influence. Well, the majority in our lifetime without laws is already having its influence on us. Look round about you. You'd have to be shut up in a box in some place somewhere where you couldn't hear or be exposed to anything round about you to not see how that things and it's very radical to some of us as old as thereabouts as I am, how things have changed in the rule of law, the attitude toward anybody in authority or any authority. Things happening today that just unheard of when I was uh, uh, growing up and even as a young man. It's just been all turned around. Well, what are we going to do? The truth is the truth is the truth regardless of how friendly or unfriendly people are around us. But that same truth teaches me what to expect. It makes a difference in what to expect and how you're going to deal with it. Many are willing to be used and even die for the cause of freedom and liberty. Christ loved his own life less than doing his father's will. Luke twenty two forty two, 42, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me, talking about the agonizing, shameful death he was undergoing on the cross. And here's the disposition of heart that must be in every one of us. Nevertheless, he said, not my will, but thine be done. First Christian martyr evidenced every bit of that. He died as much like Christ did as anybody could. 
Acts 7, 58 through 60. When he is in his state of dying, he asked Christ not to lay this into their charge. And Christ on the cross has said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When you're right, and you know you're right, as the Bible defines the right, you're safe from all harm. Well, they're going to kill me. Christ dealt with that, didn't he? He says, I must not fear those who can kill my body because I love him and obey him. The only proper one to fear is God because he has the final control over all of it. For years and years, these things have cropped into my mind in viewing public figures, whether movie stars or television personalities or local prominent people or national or whatever. And they move as if they are the end of all things. They live as if we're going to be here forever. And as I said, I think maybe Wednesday night, I don't know, but I'll say it now. When I look at uh, the people running for president this year, look at their ages. And yet if you listen to them, I don't care what the position is. I'm just talking about their chronological age. They speak as if I'll be around five years from now and ten years from now. Both of them may not be around to see an election. Have you ever noticed all these people talking about who's going to win? Who's, they don't even think about, I may not be here to see an election. One's 81, the other's what, 78, 77? And yet they don't seem, don't seem to bother them at all. What does that tell us how easy it is to be deceived all the time, even knowing what God said? That it's appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. Hebrews 9, 27. We get caught up in the way we live. And I remember hearing Brother B.C. Goodpasture long years ago deliver his last sermon. He didn't know him. We didn't know it was his last sermon, but it was. And when he got up to speak, he said, I want to say this before I begin my sermon. He said, I'm having these little blackouts and I think they were mini strokes is what they were and they hit me every once in a while and I don't know when I black out whether I've been blacked out for a tenth of a second or a minute and he says you know I, I, I'm 80 I think he was 83 or 4 5 something like that when he died and um, he said I stand here today and I think and I feel I look at things just like I always have. But, you know, when I get up in the morning and look in the mirror to shave, he said, there's somebody looking back at me that I don't recognize because I have to see an old man looking back at me. But he said, inwardly, I don't think that way. And after he got through preaching, he had the one who introduced him to get back up and say he hoped that he didn't stumble too much in his sermon because he said he had a couple of those little blackout spells while he was preaching. Well, you, couldn't, you didn't know it. It was so brief. But in his mind, he didn't know. A month later, he got out of his car to go to the house, fell dead of a massive stroke in his driveway. But as far as he was concerned, as we move, as I'm doing now, as you're sitting there now, you feel normal, don't you? It's so easy. I don't know why we're the way we are this way. But it's so easy to think, just continues on and then snap. It's all over with. Sometimes it comes slower than that as the biological part of it ceases to function. Then sometimes it goes very fast. We must keep that in mind. James trying to get it over to us when he said life is like a vapor. It appears for a little while then vanishes the way. We can't get that over it seems like. And then Revelation 2.10 makes it clear. Be thou faithful unto death. You remain faithful even if being faithful costs you your life. Or cost you anything else in order to be faithful. It also costs us self-denial. Now folks listen. That's one of the hardest things in the world to do. 
is to deny self. But Jesus in Mark 8 and verse 34 said, Whosoever will come after me, let him, there's that command again, let. That's the force of a command. By your will, you put this into practice. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Self must be dethroned and Christ must be enthroned in our heart and in our life. That's the idea behind Romans 6, 17, and 18, which was written to those who already obeyed the gospel. God, be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart. From the heart. What is the human heart? Not the blood pump or the muscle. It's the inward man. It's the real you. It's your spirit fathered by God. That involves obeying from the heart means you've obeyed not only from your will, but your intellect, your feelings and your conscience, your whole being has been brought into subjection to Jesus Christ because you've set self aside and enthroned Christ. Christ set the example, the perfect example of self-denial. Paul referred to that in getting brethren of 2,000 years ago, like we are, to realize this important point. He wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, For ye know the grace, the favor of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes, there was a reason he did this, he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Now back to what I referred you to in the book of Philippians a while ago. Philippians 2, 5 through 9. And we'll be emphasizing this at this point. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, not a thing to be grasped or held on to, but made himself of no reputation. Notice he made himself of no reputation. How did he do that? And took upon himself the form of a servant was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now look what that did for him. Wherefore God, that's the conclusion, wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Is it any wonder then that John would say to Christians, we don't know what we shall be like, the church, the faithful disciples of the Lord. But when he comes back and we see him as he is, we will be like him. Glorified humanity. I wish I could understand more about that. But I don't know with our finite minds, fleshly minds, we could understand more than what we have revealed. But our determination to give up self and our personal likes and dislikes and our opinions is seen even in a faithful Christian dealing with a weak brother in Christ. And that's what he does in 1 Corinthians 8, 13. As Paul writes, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. What's he saying? I don't want to do anything that's going to cause a brother to sin. Even though what I'm doing because I know more than he does, is not sinful, but he doesn't understand. What does that say? I've got to be mindful of the other person's viewpoint, of where they are in their growth and development in the knowledge and practice of the truth. I've got to be mindful of that. Now, that's not hard to understand when you think about parents rearing children. Parents have to be mindful. In fact, you've got to be careful about things like that. Kids will try something you do because you're mama or daddy, and they can't handle it, and they'll hurt themselves in it. They'll do it simply because they want to be like daddy or mama. But there's that great example of self-denial in spiritual matters. Again, he would write in 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 9, but take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours, that is what we enjoy in freedom in Christ, free from our sins, free from the law of Moses, become a stumbling block to them that are weak. It's the same thing. Now, God didn't expect, of course, people to remain weak in knowledge and practice of the truth. He expected them to grow. But it also 
indicates that strong brethren who have practiced and mature in the faith must be mindful of the weak. And they must not just say, well, there's nothing wrong with that. I'll just go ahead and do it when the other person doesn't understand. If you think about it for a minute, if you had good parents, there's times they set you down and said, let me explain this to you. Or you can't go do that. You'll have to, you'll have to wait. I think I can remember times that I was told, oh, you move on out of the way, you, you're going to get stepped on. <laughs> Something like that. This is going to happen. You can't handle that. Let daddy do that or let mama do that. Be careful. I remember mama talking about cooking. One of the things that she'd always say was, when you have your pot on the stove, always turn the handle back around toward the stove because you can, somebody can pull it off on you. That's a little thing, isn't it? What's well, a little thing somebody, some kid about three years old, pulls a scalding water off on him, and that's happened. But we don't think about that when it comes to spiritual growth and development, and yet it's all there. Notice he talks about being a disciple is, is daily cross-bearing. Matthew 10, 38, And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. And Luke 9, 23, and he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself again and take up his cross daily and follow me. You will be tested. You will be tried. The cost of discipleship, you'll have to consider. To take up one's cross then means to undergo trials, means undergo reproaches means to undergo dishonor as far as the world's concerned. That's the idea. Are we able to do that? I think I've said this before. I'm not sure. probably have. I haven't seen this bumper sticker in a long time. And maybe with today's mood <laughs> that's going on, maybe one reason we haven't. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? That's pretty important. You can't be what the Bible says you ought to be every day and not be criticized for it at some point or the other. Now, this is not ruling out being wise in what you say and how you answer. We'll get into some of that later on. But I'm just simply saying what we're dealing with here is a routine, regular part of being faithful to God. And the laws of our lands up to this point had basically protected us. And we didn't have to face what they faced back then. And a lot of other places are facing now. You might be surprised how much persecution is going on in this world among those, not that they're New Testament Christians, but they believe in God our Father and the Bible is the Word of God and Christ the Son of God. How people can treat them. Our Lord bore His cross with honor. And we're taught in Hebrews 12 and verse 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, won't that, doesn't that make it even better as to why Paul would begin writing a letter to the church in imperial Rome saying, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. When that gospel's basic rudiments is the death of the burial and resurrection of Christ. And that death was upon the cross. So even though the preaching of it meant prison, it meant various privations and beatings and forsaking of friends, he wasn't ashamed of undergoing all that because he obeyed his Lord. There are some crosses that may seem almost unbearable, but we bear them because we're faithful. Our confidence is in Jesus Christ and in his gospel. And one must be willing to have his own household as a foe many times. Luke 12, 51 through 53. I would say among faithful brethren, this has probably been one of the ways that we've suffered as much over the years as any. They stand for the truth even if it means losing family members. But it's all part of serving God. In Luke 12, 51 through 53, Christ asked those people in vaccinating them for what was to come. He asked those people this. 
Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth. I tell you no, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two, two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, and the daughter against the mother, the mother against the daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Now, that's pretty plain. I don't think we need an interpreter to tell us that. Yet, I have seen over the years people that might not bend to outward forces, but when family situations took place, they readily bent and even defended their family in the sins they were in. I preached one time in a place where such was going on, at least with certain, certain ones. And I made the comment from the pulpit in a sermon, some people's family blood's much thicker than the Lord's blood. That didn't set too well because they didn't intend to change. But it was the truth. And then in 2 Timothy 3, 12, Paul's speaking to a young preacher who's going to be around after Paul's gone. And if he's going to be faithful, he's going to have to endure as Paul did. And he says, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's pretty plain. Christ was mocked. He was belittled. He was made a lot of. He was ridiculed. Matthew 27 and verse 29. Sometimes ridicule and Mockery and being made light of and people speaking evil of you can be harder sometimes than just taking some other kind. But the only thing they should, that all these things should do is to make the individual Christian who's undergoing those things say, now wait, is this happening to me because I love the truth and I'm obeying it and I will not compromise or have I done something wrong and I deserve that criticism? Well, that's not hard to answer if you know the Bible. You know when you've done wrong and you suffer for it. There's nothing to be happy about that. But when you do right, as the Bible defines the right, you're living the Christian life and suffer for it. That's all part and parcel. So there should be no amazement on our part. And Christ laid this down 2,000 years ago, if you would be his disciple. When these things come, again, let me hasten to say time to come not this afternoon but later we want to look at ways that we don't just naturally say there's a line i'm a christian let's go run and jump in his mouth we don't do that so there's things to be dealt with along that line and we can see that in things in the bible just like we can see this but this was routine to christians for a long time to one extent or the other and i suggest to you anybody that's lived faithful to god in the church in the length of time and stood up for the truth preached christ and him crucified exposed error and opposed evil in people, you have suffered some persecution. Ridicule and mockery and all that kind of thing goes along with it. It can often come against us. I would suggest if you don't do it for any other reason, there are plenty of other reasons to do it that you read what the brethren of the early 19th century underwent from their religious neighbors when they sought to restore ancient, pure, primitive New Testament Christianity. They lost all encouragement from all the denominations around them. And they suffered a lot of indignities because they sought to go back and speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where it was silent, do Bible things in Bible ways, and call Bible things by Bible names. But we also see how much that flourished and how much it appealed to the right people. The last point I want to make is that in this question is being a disciple of the Lord worth the cost. Well, if it's not, nothing is worth the cost of what we pay for it. If we view it from man's own standpoint, as if there's no God and we want to get along to get along, then the cost is just too great. But if we view it from God's standpoint, from eternity's standpoint, it seems rather a small thing. Who really, looking at it from the way we judge what's hard or difficult and what's not, who really had the hard part in saving us from sin? God. See what Christ did. We could never do it. He did it for us. 
What is our part? Very hard? No. Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Obey him. Take him at his word. Act in faith on that and do his will. Don't you think that when Stephen died under those stones so hatefully thrown at him as he preached the gospel to save the very ones that killed him, don't you think the moment he stepped into eternity, it was all worth it? More than our minds can grasp even now. Discipleship is of greater benefit and honor than being able to perform miracles according to Jesus in Luke 10, 17 through 20. And they were standing amazed at the miracles that were done. Following him closely, being faithful to him, the miracles were designed to say this man is the son of God. So the faith produced in one based upon the word of Christ is a greater thing. It's a greater honor than being the mother that brought Jesus into the world, Luke eleven twenty seven. 27. Notice how it's said in the King James Version, Blessed is the womb that bare thee and the paps which thou hast sucked. Then Jesus said, in the very next verse, that's Luke, 8, Luke 11, um, 27. In verse 28, he said, and this is an answer to that. Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. It's amazing. So we close this morning with this first installment in reminding us as children of God, members of the New Testament church, this is not an unusual thing. And it should not terrify us that people of the world hate us as we labor hard to walk the straight and narrow way, to be steadfast and unmovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord, to see people oppose us, ridicule us, mock us, and maybe in other ways actually hurt us bodily or in some way or the other. Peter put it this way in 1 Peter 1, 4 and 5. Here's what we have. An inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. Folks, we who are faithful to the Lord according to his good word have sustenance and strength and insights the world and weak brethren and apostate brethren know not of. And we need to tap into it. We don't need to retreat from anything. We need to be on the offensive. And we need to look at problems that come upon us because we're faithful as opportunities to teach the truth and to show forth Christ living in us. And we want to talk a little bit about that this afternoon. If you're not a child of God this morning, we beg of you, we plead with you by the mercies of Jesus Christ. Set your affections on things above, not on things on this earth. Obey the gospel of Christ by believing that Christ is the Son of God with all your heart, with a resolve to follow Him, let come what may. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Christ. Complete your obedience to the gospel by being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. And in that great church, the Lord's spiritual body, as a member of it, live faithful no matter what comes our way, whether you're here another year, 10 years, or 50. All these years must end and the flesh must cease. But when you step over into that realm unknown to the human senses, there shall be before us a vast eternity unending. And I want to see my master and be with him forevermore. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.